Returning to the moon after over 50 years is a significant milestone that the IM-1 mission has brought to the forefront of the U.S. aerospace industry. However, as history has shown, lunar exploration is far from being straightforward. NASA recently disclosed that the Nova C. Odysseus lunar lander has encountered unexpected challenges, casting uncertainty over its current status. The question arises, why is the Odysseus lander facing issues? Can these challenges be overcome? And what implications? And what implications will the IM-1 mission have on future lunar endeavors? Join us as we delve into these questions on today's episode of Great SpaceX. Most recently, Intuitive Machines gave us an update with two more images of the lunar surface when the lander vertically descended to its Malapert A landing site, pitching over during its approach to the landing site approximately 35 seconds after. I thought this was a good sign after many problems over the past few days, but in Intuitive Machines promptly announced on February 26th that they expect to communicate with the Odysseus lunar lander for only one more day, a much shorter timeline than previously expected. In its press kit issued before the launch of the IM-1 mission, Intuitive Machines stated that it expected the lander to operate for about seven days before the lunar night sets on the south pole of the moon, rendering Odysseus inoperable. At the February 23rd briefing, Crane offered a best-case scenario of nine to ten days of operations after landing. So, why did the IM-1 mission fall into this situation? On February 23rd, in a media teleconference press, CEO and co-founder of Intuitive Machines Steve Aldemus admitted the real situation of the Odysseus lunar lander. Specifically, instead of upright on the surface like the previous update, the lunar lander tipped over. Perhaps during the landing, one of the lunar lander's legs caught a crevice or some other object in the rough terrain of the moon. Currently, it may be lying on its side on a rock or steep terrain. The reason for this is because the lunar landing's landing speed and direction were not as expected. The planned landing speed would have been approximately 3 kilometers per hour in the vertical direction direction with no horizontal velocity, but in reality it landed at a speed of 10 kilometers per hour in the vertical direction and 3.2 kilometers per hour in the horizontal direction. That means the lander did not land vertically, instead it landed at an inclined descension to the lunar surface. That led to a landing leg on one side of the lander hitting the ground first. Even on flat terrain, such a landing will definitely create a stumble that will cause it to fall towards that landing leg side. Meanwhile, the moon's surface is very rough, especially the area where Odysseus landed, the Malpert A crater near the moon's south pole, making the risk rate even higher. When one leg of the lander crashes into a crevice or a rock, it will immediately be affected by inertia and flip over. Additionally, the design of this lander is vertical, with a height of 4.3 meters and a diameter of 1.3 57. This design is to optimize the installation of solar panels and communication antennas. But such a structure will certainly be more difficult to keep balanced than a horizontal structure design. Moreover, there are other payloads and quite a large amount of fuel inside the spacecraft. It would cause the lander to easily tip over when touching down on the surface. With this posture, some solar panels will be horizontal instead of vertical. That makes it more difficult to absorb energy from the sun. Fortunately, this solar cell was previously fully charged and Intuitive Machines also confirmed its energy was at 100%. But that's not really positive either. According to estimates, in less than a week, this area will enter darkness without sunlight. This period will last 14 to 15 days and the hope for electronic devices to survive more than two weeks of cold is about slim to none. Another problem with the lunar lander's system was that the laser rangefinder system was not working before the landing. This device serves to act accurately measure the lander's altitude and landing site. When the problem with this device occurred, CEO Steve Aldemus exclaimed, it was like a punch in the stomach. We were going to lose the mission. Although the landing process still took place after that, it was also part of the problems with the aforementioned landing and caused the current landing location
position to be several kilometers away from the intended landing site. Meanwhile, other payloads appeared to be operating normally, Ultima said. So far, we have quite a bit of operational capability even though we're tipped over. Most of the payload is still pointed toward Earth, so data transmission can still operate. The biggest problem is that an important spacecraft communication antenna appears to be pointing down on the surface, making connectivity more difficult. The navigation Doppler LiDAR device, activated previously to replace the laser rangefinder, is still active. Another important payload right now, the Eagle Cam, which is a camera designed to capture the lunar lander's descent, was not deployed due to difficulties in this process, combined with intuitive machines activating the navigation Doppler LiDAR system. But the team is planning to activate it soon to take images of the lunar lander. The biggest challenge with this operation will be the current posture of the lunar lander. Fortunately, NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter just sent images about the lunar lander's location, which is an extreme extremely important piece of information currently. Indeed, the road to the moon is really challenging for everyone. Attempts from late last year to early this have all encountered many problems. There was Russia's Luna 25, NASA's Astrobotic Peregrine, both dealt with fuel leak problems that prevented them from landing. There's also Japan's Slim and Odysseus, especially with Slim completely flipped over, causing the engine to point upward. The only the only reigning champ in perfect lunar descent was India's Chandrayaan-3, seemingly to be the most stable out of all. But it also couldn't survive in the darkness of space, having met the absence of sunlight on the dark side of the moon. Which is what Odysseus is about to experience. Folks, I guess you could say that after more than 50 years, things have really changed. But in the end, for NASA, Odysseus also took a big stride. According to Joel Kearns, NASA's Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration, Odysseus has achieved three major achievements. First, it was the U.S.'s first successful soft landing mission since 1972. Second, it's the world's first private mission to reach the moon safely. And finally, it basically achieved NASA's goal of landing in the southern pole region of the moon with a latitude of about 80 degrees south, an area where they will compete with many other countries to exploit water ice resources, pushing toward moon base construction. In reality, Odysseus overcame the fuel problem. Before the flight, there was a problem with the fuel loading process, causing the mission to be delayed for about a day. But since Odysseus is always in excellent health, this means SpaceX and Intuitive Machines have handled this problem well. Let's not forget that this is the first mission where cryogenic liquid fuel, including oxygen and methane, has traveled so far. To date, China is the first country that can send a methane rocket into orbit, but only to orbit. Reaching the moon is clearly at a higher level. This will be the basis for SpaceX to confidently develop the HLS variant of Starship using these fuels for the Artemis mission. But other than dealing with these issues, NASA and Intuitive Machines will have to look forward to the next lunar missions. In their roadmap after IM-1, the two organizations still have IM-2 and 3 in late 2024 and early 2025 respectively. Based on experiences with IM-1, they will need to make changes toward success with those missions. Meanwhile, Firefly Aerospace will launch the Blue Ghost M1 mission on SpaceX's Falcon 9 around the third quarter of this year. Astrobotic Technologies has another landing attempt called Griffin Mission 1 that will also be launched on SpaceX's Falcon Heavy in November. In the same month, NASA will also use the Falcon Heavy to launch the Viper mission to the moon's south pole. Most notably, sometime in 2025, SpaceX will also conduct a lunar landing demo mission that will land the uncrewed HLS Starship on the moon. Thus, it can be seen that these missions all will have a lot of potential and the common theme is that they are all related to SpaceX. With the reliability of the Falcon rockets as well as the potential of Starship, I hope our next lunar efforts can succeed paving the way for the success of the Artemis mission later. So don't fret about the IM-1 mission having its own bit of problems, because I believe that I am, that the IM team will try to solve these issues and complete the rest of the mission as much as possible. This will be the valuable experience that NASA, Intuitive Machines, and many other organizations, especially SpaceX, can count on to achieve success in the future. Humans are stepping closer to the moon, and I believe that in a few years to come, we will truly master 
this natural satellite. Well, folks, that's about it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. And as always, this is Kevin from Great SpaceX. And until next time, keep looking up.